Welcome, symbol lovers, to another edition of Understanding the Symbols of Hieronymus Bosch. And this time around, we're going to take a look at the outside panels of the Garden of Earthly Delights. So the Garden of Earthly Delights is an altarpiece and triptych made from five panels. They're about five feet high, and these are the two outer panels, and these separate in the middle and open up to reveal the three inner panels. The Garden of Earthly Delights is important because it contains all the secrets of Bosch's Bible-based pleasure cult. So what we have here is two panels, but they're dominated by a design of the earth. In fact, the earth is filling the largest part of the volume of this painting as possible, whereas God is just tucked into that corner in the upper left. So God is of secondary importance, but the earth is the primary concern of the artist Hieronymus Bosch, and of course it's mankind that is the primary concern, which we'll see when we open these panels. So we have a picture of God in his heaven looking down over the earth. In the sky above the earth, we see clouds. We also see a highlight on the earth. And this would be caused by the sun. So the sun is shining over our shoulder on the left, which puts the sun at the right hand of God. And so God's sunlight is shining on the earth. And if you look close, you can see next to the highlight of the earth, there's a rainbow appearing. Bosch has printed a Bible passage across the top of the panels, but it will be useful in understanding the meaning of the entire altarpiece if we look at not only the quote, but also the chapter from which it's from. So, we read, Rejoice in the Lord, O righteous ones. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him with ten strings. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. And so that's what's quoted across the top. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. But look what else it says. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. He shapes the hearts of each. He considers all their works. No king is saved by his vast army. No warrior is delivered by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for salvation. Even its great strength cannot save. So Bosch has depicted God looking down from his heaven, and he's going to be judging the works of men. And if we open up those panels, we can see other parts of the 33rd Psalm. Using the Bible passage as our guide, we look around for other symbols inside that passage, and we find four of them on the inner panels on the what's known as the hellscape. So here in the background, we do see some king's vast army, which is causing a lot of destruction, but will bring about no salvation. And it's the same story for the warrior. He is not going to be delivered by his great strength. Nor is the horse going to offer any hope of salvation. And finally, below the horse, we have the harp the one on which we're supposed to praise the Lord. But notice in Bosch's world, the musical instruments have become instruments of torture. But also remember, we started out with that quotation at the top of everything. For he spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. So if God has commanded to be celebrated on the harp, 
then even though it's not happening at the current time, it will happen because God has intended it. So the unintended evil is done away with and paradise as originally intended by God will be restored to the earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. At least that's what Jesus said, and it's always about Jesus. To get a deeper meaning of the panels, we need to go back to the idea of it's exactly what it looks like. So what does it look like? It looks like we're viewing the earth from outer space, or even heaven, because we can look right over there and see God. So we're having a vision of heaven as well as a vision of the earth. It's not the real earth, it's a symbolic earth. And the nature of the symbols leads us to Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a prophet of God who lived in Babylon, but he lived there as an exile and a slave in the land of false religion and Bosch would have understood him to be his spiritual brother. So let's see what we can learn from Ezekiel. While I was among the exiles by a river in Babylon, the heavens opened and I saw visions of God. I looked and saw a whirlwind, a great cloud with fire flashing and brilliant light. Within it was the form of four living creatures. When I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature. The workmanship of the wheels looked like a wheel within a wheel. Above the expanse, over their heads, was the likeness of a throne, and on the throne was a figure <laughs> like that of a man. The appearance of the brilliant light all around him was like that of a rainbow. So Bosch isn't using a wheel within a wheel, but he is using a circle within a circle. And that is a sign of heavenly workmanship, and a circle is a sign for God, because it has no beginning or end, and because there is no real point to it. So from Ezekiel we get the idea of the wheel within the wheel or the circle within the circle as being an identifier of God's workmanship. Now I want you to focus on just about the middle of the central panel at that group of figures riding the animals in circles around the pond. So what we have is a bunch of creatures on dry land circling a round body of water. On the outside panels, we have a circle of water around dry land. And the circle and the angle of the circle is just about the same on the inside and the outside. And this is to help us tie in the design and that the ideas expressed on the outside are the same as those on the inside. So it's exactly what it looks like. God is in his heaven overlooking the earth. The earth has rain clouds and a rainbow as well as dry land surrounded by water. And the question is, can we find it in the Bible? And the answer is yes, in Second Peter. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forgot that God made the heavens long ago by word of his command, and he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. So just as Bosch used symbols from the 33rd Psalm, both on the outside and inside, he does the same thing here with Second Peter. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. 
and, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are being stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment, when ungodly people will be destroyed. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? But in keeping with God's promise, we are looking forward to a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is to dwell. So the center panel of the Garden of Earthly Delights represents that new earth. So this is the kingdom of God, and we can tell it's the kingdom of God by all the fruit. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, says Jesus, if you love one another. And so what is our metaphor for love? I am the vine, you are the branches. The ones that remain in me, and I in him, will bear much fruit. So the fruit represents the love expressed by his disciples. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, proving yourselves to be my disciples. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I have appointed you to go and bear fruit. And so fruit is proof of the discipleship of Jesus, and these people have fruit in abundance. They lounge on fruit. They live in fruit. They wear fruit. They float in fruit. They boat in fruit. They do everything with fruit. They are the people of fruit. This is the way it was meant to be from the beginning. These are the righteous. So then, by their fruit, you will recognize them. I, for one, would recognize them anywhere. So the fruit identifies the central panel as the kingdom of God, as well as our circle within the circle in the center of it. To sum up, we took our visual images from Bosch and used them to identify certain Bible passages that would inform us as to the general theme of the entire altarpiece. From the Bible we learn. God sees the violence. He will ask for an accounting. He will cleanse the earth. He will have his will done on earth as it is in heaven. And there will be a new heavens and a new earth. So getting back to Second Peter, Bosch wants us to understand that what's happening is this is the time of Noah and God is giving the Rainbow Covenant. The Rainbow Covenant is significant because it establishes God's prohibition against blood spilling. And at this time, the church was running its own torture chambers. They'd been burning tens of thousands of people at the stake for over a thousand years by the time Bosch painted the Garden of Earthly Delights. So Bosch, like the psalmist, did not look to kings, warriors, or the church for salvation. He considered himself a spiritual exile, like Ezekiel. And, like Peter, he looked forward to the destruction of the wicked system and the establishment of the new heavens and new earth. And you no doubt knew that because you've been watching Understanding the Symbols of Hieronymus Bosch. So now I can tell you about Bosch's secret Bible-based, feminine-oriented, gay-friendly, natural birth control practicing mutual pleasure cult. Or maybe I can't. My Uber's here. Maybe we'll get to it next time. Thanks for watching. Hey, mister, I think your wheel's on fire. Whee!